Well, welcome everyone. I'm Vince Gennaro. I'm the president of Sabre and the uh, associate dean at uh, NYU's uh, Tisch Institute for Global Sport. Uh, we're delighted to have everybody here. Uh, Mark and I uh, co-founded this conference seven years ago. It's hard to believe this is the seventh annual. I see many familiar faces, but I see a lot of new faces here this year, which is always exciting. We're, we're on a mission to really um, bring together the, the thinkers and the doers in this space of baseball analytics and, and, and get a dialogue going and continue the dialogue. The dialogue is happening all over. It's happening on places like MLB Network on MLB Now from people like Brian Kenny, who you'll see in just a moment. But we also believe that this is a great forum where we can bring a lot of the thought leaders together, have them participate in the way of panels, give research presentations, and of course we do our Diamond Dollars case competition, which this year will be the biggest ever. Uh, 23 student teams uh, are here to compete in the competition tonight. We're very excited about that. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Appleman for his few words and then we'll get started with the program. But welcome. Thanks, Vince, and welcome. And it is hard to believe that it's been seven years now. It seems like we just, just started this. But um, as you've seen from the schedule, and as you know, this year's conference is a little bit different, partly because of the hotel. So we had to go Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So just to give you a little bit um, of the lay of the land for the schedule, today we will be in this room all afternoon until 5 o'clock, and then Vince will introduce the case comp, and then the case competition will be upstairs in a number of rooms up there. And then tomorrow we get started in this room at 8.30. We go through the day till 5.30, and then we'll have a welcome reception, the second day welcome reception, and that'll be upstairs. And then on Sunday, we go from 8.30 to 2. So it's pretty concentrated and focused. Just about everything except the case comp will be in this room. Um, I want to introduce a couple of people, actually four people. We have our Yosiloff Award winners. And thanks to Tony Yosiloff, um, who supports them and sponsors them to come to the conference. Now, they won this through a essay contest. And so they're here joining us. And if you could stand. That would be great, and let me introduce them. There's there's Sierra Doherty, and she's from Coastal Carolina University. Troy Munch from Wisconsin Lutheran College. Julia Persachik from Tufts University. and Noah Purcell from Coe College. And in advance of I know what's going to be a great conference, I want to thank the Sabre staff, Deb, Jacob, Jeff, and Blaine, and all our interns. And I want to thank the speakers, presenters, sponsors, Vince, of course, for helping me put this together. And as we've been doing over the last few conferences, if you do have questions, there are some cards in the back with pens. If you'll just put the questions there, then we'll bring them up and the speakers will answer them at the end. We always leave enough time for um, Q&A. And without further ado, let me introduce quickly our first panel, which is the state of analytics. And I can't think of two better people to talk about this than Brian Kenny, who's a regular at our conference, and we really appreciate that. I think most of you know Brian from MLB Network and from his really successful book, Ahead of the Curve, Inside the Baseball Revolution. And we also have John Boog. Um, Shyamvi, who you know from ESPN Radio, and ESPN does Wednesday Night Baseball. And so let me introduce Brian and John. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, it's funny, because uh, Boog and I don't get to chat a lot. Is this good, you think? Yeah, absolutely. We, go. we don't get to chat a lot. Uh, I'm an, an, no. I'm an admirer of your work. Uh, there's very few in the, in the mainstream media that have kind of, I don't recognize what's really going on for the last two and a half decades, and, and you're one of them. And, and on the play-by-play -play side, that's, uh, that's awesome, because I think it's actually a little more difficult 
if you're, if you're in the weeds to see exactly what's there. Because I think a lot of play-by-play -play and color commentators have been kind of the last to see things. Maybe we'll start there. Again, I'm a admirer of your work. Uh, I love listening to your, you know, your craft. And it is difficult to try to get things in while you also have another job in, in calling the game. But I'm interested in that, in that it seems like the part of the media that is the slowest to get there are the guys who are covering the teams and maybe because you are so close. What do you think of that? Well, the first thing I would say is that in terms of on air, you have to remember that it's not as simple as just convincing the broadcasters. In a game production, you have a graphics guy who's going to build graphics packages you know, partially on his own, and a producer, and a director, and so many components that have to be bought in. I'm fortunate on Wednesday Night Baseball, I have a great producer, Jeff Dufine, and a great group overall that's interested in telling people what's happening. So that, you know, I'm just not down to sit there and talk about a guy who's got a 290 on base percentage and knocked in 100 runs and say he had a great year. Right. That's not what's happening. It, it's an interesting point in that, you know, we deal, like, the bigger the operation and calling a game for television and calling a game for national television is a, a big operation. And when I was doing Baseball Tonight for ESPN, um, it, it is, it's also, there's a lot of people involved, and it, was, it became like a fight to get it across. But only to say, hey, look, I'm doing a highlight, and as I described in my book, it's difficult to do a highlight and say, okay, there's Bobby Abreu, double to the gap, drives in a run, you know, and it takes a little while for the guy to get around the bases, and you know, you gotta, you gotta say something. So you're doing the highlight, and I'm, instead of throwing out he's got, you know, he's got 68 RBIs, well, what does that mean? Are we in May, are we in August, or how many is that? I would say, like, he's got a 400 on base, or a 440 on base, he's slugging 520, and uh, it was met with massive resistance. This was, this was 13 years ago, Yeah. right? I mean, this was, maybe, maybe it was like 15 years ago now, I'm getting a little older. Um, but it wasn't that long ago, but it was, just came from, you know, having the knowledge and then, you know, something happens and you want to go and relay how good this is and you'll say, he leads the league in X. Now, I used to say RBIs, you know, I was a sportscaster sure. in 1988, I'd say RBIs, I'd say batting average, the batting champion, I did all that. But as, you know, I got through in the early 90s even, I was doing other stuff, and for that I was almost burned at the stake. I hear you. I, <laughs> look, there, there's still, no matter what anybody says, there's still the wrestling match in media and even still inside the game. I know there are baseball people in here, but there are still scouts. It is easy to get a scout going. Someone somewhere on the, that Sabre stuff, you know, like <laughs> that you just, you can. And it's still growing. Look, for me, the starting point was you try and keep an open mind and reading Bill James and Rob Nyer I was taught the way everybody else was taught, the bunt is good and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I couldn't come up with a better argument. Their arguments were more sound than what I would counter with. And so mm -hmm. I learned and I'm open to continuing to learn. I think it's one of the things I love about my job, as corny as it sounds, I love calling the game, okay? I like learning about it, man. Right. It nourishes my mind. It's interesting as hell. And don't kid yourself. I'm not bringing the potato salad to the Mensa picnic, all right? I'm not that bright. <laughs> but, like, I'm interested in getting smarter. That's so... <laughs> I didn't realize it was a barbecue. See, yeah, I have, I've also I've not been there. <laughs> so let me, let me start there. First of all, welcome. I, I think this is a great room. Um, as we see, you know, college kids... And, and, and meeting, uh, you know, Costia Kennedy is here with his college group from, from NYU. Am I correct on that? There, okay. And, you know, and seeing some familiar faces, also seeing some of the legends of the game that we're writing about this stuff as John Thorne is looking me in the face and Pete Palmer is gonna be honored later. Um, the guys who wrote this stuff in 1984, um, and you talk about like just, you know, seen as crackpots uh, to, to use your, still as viewed as a right. For other reasons, uh, but to see. And, uh, you know, I saw Voros McCracken outside, and Rob Nyer is here, and it's like, man, there's pioneers here who were doing this when very few people were doing this. And now it has taken over. Let's recognize this. And by the way, forgive my voice. I've been doing important field work, <clears throat> you know, out in the field. We just did, uh, I did seven clubs in seven days for the 30 clubs in 30 days for MLB you know, out in Arizona. All right, you work hard. We get it. All right. <laughs> Can I, get in, can I get in a plug? Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. go ahead. I'm not working for the empire. Just yeah. another empire. I'll be doing um, <laughs> all the voiceovers. 
Um, so, um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, so my voice is a little gone. This is good that we're, we can have this chat. Uh, but, I mean, the main thing is being out in the field, man, I learned a lot. So it's kind of a combination of, right, I'm asking coaches. I'm asking, I'm, and there's guys hidden from our view, right? Now, maybe you get to see them, you don't. But I'm in different camps in different places. And there's pitching strategists. There's hitting strategists. Uh, that are not, and the hitting strategist might not even be in the cage with the guy. Not just working on, you're holding your hands here, you're holding your hands here. There's other guys for that. There's all, there's all sorts of people doing things, and they're attacking these. So really, the sabermetric takeover uh, that began, the spark that began in this room, I mean, to me, is an amazing story. From that, from teams now launching way past where we're looking, because it used to be the, the thought leaders in the field were clearly the sabermetric writers to where now it's getting to be, uh, and it should have been this way all along, in the industry with their proprietary information, they're taking off. And you know, look, just even looking at the Diamondbacks and the Brewers, these clubs that are just now launching and skyrocketing uh, and, and taking off to places that we can only imagine. And I, did, I, I, learned, I was out in the field with Sean Casey and Carlos Pena, we're talking effective velocity, and I learned, I learned a lot. And right, so I don't want to make it like, you know, in the old days, it'd be grunt and spit. No way, man. Yeah. Not now. Now, it, now they are applying the strategy. Yeah, and I think it's still a crucial component of this whole thing in terms of taking the information, and the front offices are using it for player evaluation, but you're seeing more and more impact on the field. The Astros are a good example. You know, there, there are some teams that have someone that is really hands-on with the day-to-day -day information, and he's not interacting with the players in the clubhouse. So sometimes in cert with certain teams, that information is being disseminated and it feels like it's, being, it's coming from someone behind a curtain. The Astros, for example, they have their guy in the pitcher meetings. Right. So ultimately, right. if the pitcher wants to know, well, why are we doing this this way? Or why, is, why are we shifting here? Or why is this happening? You want to know? Come here, I'll tell you. Right. And it has to be delivered by someone, I mean, who, who is able to put it across in a digestible manner for the players. But that's happening more and more. And more and more, I'm seeing teams, and this was like some revolutionary concept, and it was blasted at the time. Uh, the Rockies, right, with Bill Guy Vett, who actually had a little office in the clubhouse, and he can't be in the clubhouse, what's he doing here? And I was a grumble, grumble, grumble of the old players that I work with. We all do uh, Jim Leland, is basically <laughs> what we do when we do that. And uh, all these old ball players, like, you can't be that way. And it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. Why? You know, there, you actually have uh, converging interests here. You're, you know, you're incentivized. The, the incentive system is the same. You want your players to be better. And more and more, I was, I would say I was surprised, but I was, was a little taken aback, team by team, that these baseball ops people, and they're sprinkled all around here, are now in the clubhouse. So they're into the regular, and the Brewers just recently, I was there uh, yesterday, uh, and they were uh, talked about connectedness. And they want it seamless from the top to the bottom, to their minor league players, up to the team president. Everybody is connected. And it's such a smart, holistic way of doing things. The Astros, that's what I thought the Astros five years ago. I go, these guys are gonna win. And I said it at this conference, right, Vince, was it 2013? I said, five years from now, will the Astros be winning 90 games a season? And everybody laughed. And then as I asked each panelist, Dave Cameron was on the board, Bill James was in the audience, and everyone said, yes, they will, yes, they will, yes, they will, yes, they will. Bill James, I said, Bill James, how about you? You're sitting out in the audience. He said, 95. They're world champions in five years. So that's where it's at, and because they, they went in holistically. Yep. So everybody is buying in, and now to hear all these other clubs that were not with the program now saying, why wouldn't I want my baseball ops guy who is studying this pitcher who, who knows, I talked to Zach Davies, you know, like maybe your slider's getting battered. Like your slider, but is it your slider? Or is it your sequence getting to your sliders? Right. And uh, Carlos Pena had a, a way of putting it. Carlos Pena's really into, uh, you, you guys know Carlos on our show, hit 46 home runs one year. He said, he puts it in a perfect way, is into effective velocity. And this is where the, the war is being waged, right? Because the other part is the wider macro economic sabermetric takeover of this winter. That's like a winter of saber reckoning. Do that hashtag, all right, get it out there. Winter of saber <laughs> reckoning. Scott Boris going, I'll get you, Bill James, you know. You know a, or me, or you, or whoever. Whatever. But Carlos Pena put it this way. Hey, when you're pitching and you're getting battered, right? And it's something that people have written about here. 
your, what we used to call your ERA FIP differential, right? Why are you striking guys out, not walking anybody, and you're still getting your ass kicked, right? It's a problem. And Carlos Pena says, hey, it's not that your stuff isn't good enough. You're not good enough with your stuff. And I think that at the ground level is where the war is being waged. Yeah, I mean, the brewers and the connectivity part, I mean, look, there's an intangible component and, you know, the idea of connecting with players, you got to have empathy and, and really be, uh, be willing and able to, to put yourself in the player's shoes, I think, to deliver the message. Alex Cora, uh, who, full disclosure, worked at ESPN, we worked together, I'm friendly with him, I think is going to do a magnificent job. Uh, the training he got with the Astros was huge, but again, that synergy between front office field information all the way he had a great quote that tyler kepner got from him uh, in a new york times piece and he said the most important thing is you have to connect the baseball operations the analytics department the medical staff if they don't get together what's the point how are we going to filter the information from these departments to the coaches and to the players if you can't accomplish that you're in trouble and if that doesn't sum up what the manager and a team needs to be doing today, I don't know what does. Right, absolutely. That's and, and coming from, I mean, when you think about who got the jobs this year, I mean, there's always uh, different guys here or there. Um, a lot of times it goes to the best looking with the biggest shoulders and the most granite jaw. That seems to be what works everywhere. Uh, but in baseball managing now, bench coaches. Because that, for whatever reason, has become like the funnel. Because look, the manager has a lot to do. Like I would, I've advocated there should be a management staff. It's too much for one guy. But and I mean, I mean, actually a strategy staff. You'd hire like six of you guys. You'd be sitting right back there. Uh, soon there will be one in uniform. Soon. There'll mm -hmm. be one of you guys probably here, baseball ops now. Someone's going to put Sig Madol in a uniform. Someone's going to put one of you guys in a uniform. Someone's going to put a scientist in a uniform. I will tug and tell you, I don't know that I believe that if when we sit there and go over decisions, I don't know that it's possible to execute in real time all of the things, every single one of them, that we think from a probability standpoint is the best thing to have happen. But you'd give it a shot. Sure. No, yeah. I'm, I, I, no, 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 I, I get you. I'm just saying I, I yeah. don't know. Well, I, it would just be it would just be a better version of Don Zimmer. You know, that's all. It'd be a, you know, that, that's all we're looking for. Except, uh, you know, again. The manager has to focus, I don't want to go off on too, this too far, but the manager has to focus on so many things right in front of him. Who, well, so you're in the fourth inning, who's thinking of the sixth inning? Right. My six dudes, you know, like right yes. there, or women, whoever, six people right there. It can be anybody, you know, it can yep. be anybody, any gender, any race, anything. Um, so you'd have them, but looking at things hopefully in real time to find out the probabilities and just give the information and then skip, it's up to you. And then Rob, the, the same old thing with the, the managers. Yeah, well, I know that guy has the stomach flu, that guy's actually tired. That guy tweaked himself doing deadlifts. What, you know, all, yes, put it all into that. But you would want to know the best information. And what we see in the playoffs, where you're making these decisions that have huge financial ramifications, it's done by, uh, should we let him hit? OK, let him hit. You know, the pitcher's hitting. He's already gone five innings. How many more outs are we going to get, get out of him? Let's do that math. And it happens too fast. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think you know, that, that's going to happen too. But to your point, like these bench coaches now, they're, they're forged hard. I mean, if I was looking for a manager, I mean, I would go right there and, go, and look over that whole group because those are the guys who are really at the vanguard right now with all that information. And it's an important point. You're right. Having the empathy to know what works for this guy. Yeah. And how do you put, and right, they are, look, this, these are the things that outside of this room I get hammered on. They're human beings. I think that goes without saying. Like, I've always thought, yeah, no, that goes without saying. Of course, they're human beings when you're dealing with them. Um, so you have to figure how to get them to maximize their performance. Yeah, leadership is an intangible quality that's that's challenging to define. It you know it has a little bit of that pornography. I know it when I see it thing. Um, but for real. But but again, when you're when you're looking at what you what you want out of a leader, you do you do want some empathy. And I think you know you have players that have a tendency to isolate. Baseball's really judgy, man. Baseball, I mean, it's judgy. Like, every day, and I, I know the world is, but I'm telling you, you get stuff where you you get these, these visceral reactions. And so, you know, Rick Peterson is the pitching coach, and someone on the other side, hey, do you know Rick Peterson? Man, I don't like that guy. See how tight his pants are? 
<laughs> you ever met him? No. That was an actual conversation <laughs> with someone on the field. You know, so it, it, it gets a little, you, you got to push that stuff aside and be open to, to, you know, learning and understanding, and especially the guys in your clubhouse. It's funny, Carlos Pena said that as we were going. He said, I'm looking forward to meeting Ian Kinsler. And because uh, we're going to Angels camp, and I said, why? I said, I always hated that guy. I said, <laughs> why do you hate that guy? Oh, he's so cocky and everything. I said, did he ever say anything to you? He said, no. I said, well, then, isn't that your problem? He goes, of course it is, BK. Right? Of course. Like, but that's always a lot. That guy's so cocky. He walks around like this. What is, what is he doing to you? Yeah. But right. But that's it's a, look, it's the animal kingdom. I'm going to go. I'm going to do you all a favor and blow right past pace of play. Let's not do it, because I want to get to, and we'll take your questions, write them on, on cards, and we'll take a bunch of them, so get them out there now. I'll be happy to field them and do the best we can. Uh, the winter shutdown, man. I mean, it, it's finally happened, and you know, I, I wrote about this in the book, and I think I was writing it actually three years ago, and I thought, well, this is, you know, you, you can bring things out on a show that sound crazy and everybody's head spins. I like doing that. So I said, hey, here's my theory. Never spend money on a $100 million free agent. Never, 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 never do it. Now, of course, there could be a 25-year-old A-Rod, you know, be a 25-year-old Bryce Harper, et cetera. You would extend, maybe extend your 25-year-old Derek Jeter. Yeah, no, of course. But as a basic principle, do not do it. Do not hit the free agent market, certainly not for a big money contract. And this year, like finally, the gate came down. What do you make of that? I think it's a combo of things. I, I, I probably, we probably don't see it exactly the same way. I do think that part of it is I mean, look, we could sit here and go over the idea of tanking or whatever you want to call it. Um, but the, these teams that are deciding that they're going to hit the reset button, by and large, are not in the market to replace the talent that is moving out. So right. there and aren't that takes places. Like seven teams out of it. Yeah. Right. So there aren't places to land. Um, I mean. But it, wait, can I stop you on that? But isn't that a byproduct of what this group has taught us? This group has taught us where. Um, where you say, hey, why wait? And, it was, and the Astros were one of the first to go hardcore. Maybe you could point to the Marlins, too, when no one understood it. They went hardcore, fire sale. And they were pretty good like five years later, and everyone thought, they, well, they don't know what they're doing. Now, maybe they just got lucky, but um, isn't that part of it where it's like, hey, man, you, winning 78 games is nowhere. But don't let me ask it. you, are you saying, like, do you think, again, I, I get some of what you're saying, but do you think that, What's happening this off season is that players are being valued appropriately, or is it that the owners are just squeezing the players? Because I think it's as much that the owners are squeezing the players. I don't think. That, listen, I think there's the system's almost, dumb. I don't think there's. I don't think there's. I think there's almost no squeezing. I think there's a salary cap that that the players' association did not anticipate, given that they did not increase the luxury tax threshold to the point where teams could grow. So now instead of having just the Yankees and Red Sox, maybe the Phillies pushing up against the luxury tax. Now you've got a good seven or eight saying, we can't spend, and also because this free agent market is not great and the next one is great. I think it's a confluence of forces. But I think yes, the yeah. first and foremost, I think it's the smart GMs, smart assistant GMs saying, hey, this guy, yeah, he hits home runs, he played on a championship team, but this is what he actually does, pass. Yeah, I, th I think we're moving in that direction. I I'm probably, I, I, I think that, I'm not down to stamp it the way you, I mean, the Mets signed, they, they, they have Adrian Gonzalez. They could have used Adam Lind on a minor league deal to be part of a platoon. They could have signed Matt Adams and paid more money for sure. But th there's like, how much the Brewers should sign, should sign Neil Walker. How much did Aegon cost? Yeah, it's the minimum, but he, he's terrible. And he's, but oh, I, I would even argue that we could have this discussion. If we were in a, in a room, we'd say, all right, he's one year removed from being still above league average hitting. So, and it is Adrian Gonzalez. Maybe he's there's hit like less six home years. runs in about his last 300 plate appearances. And he's been injured. And there's been cases of guys and not you being like, dead. And you like the chances that he's going to get back to where he was oh, no. with aging? But, but if you're telling me, hey, two million bucks, okay, would I do it? No. I'd, I'd go your route, of course. Yeah, so, uh, so what I'm, I'm saying, saying is it's that, completely efficient. Okay, so, I, yeah, I think, but like, and even Mike Moustakis. Yeah, what do you make of that? It makes me scratch my head a little bit. I don't love him as a player. I, I, it, but for for that money, I don't know. If I'm the Angels, would you rather would you rather be into Cozart for three years, thirty eight million dollars, or would you rather be Mustakis on one year and like six and a half? Um, true, but Cozart just hit a ceiling that Mustakis will never approach. 
right? And can field and can play shortstop. But, okay, but he did a 385 on base. But can we go back to what I asked? Would you rather have Zach Cozart three and 38 or okay. Mustakis this year for six and a half? You just said true. I just said true about what? You just said true. You'd rather have Mustakis at six and a half. So the point would be. From the Angels' standpoint... Yeah, but, but wait, 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 hold on, all right, let's go out. The Angels, at the time that they're looking at Zach Kozar, right? They're having Christmas dinner, they're looking at Zach Kozar. They don't know Mustak. They, they're talking to Boris, and Boris is not saying, hey, for 8.5, you can have Mustak. And he was originally going to play that. second. Oh. Kozart was originally going, and then they, they did okay, the Okay, but I'm Kinder just saying, deal. he didn't know uh, at the time, if the Angels are looking to shop, and they're like, there's Zach My Kozart. My point for is some simply, reason, I, I don't, I, like, I think that it's, there's still some not so smart stuff being done. I don't think that every guy is, be I think we're moving in that direction. I don't think, I think there's a confluence of events right now. Let me ask you this then. Yep. How about looking at it cold hearted, ruthless. Um, Moustakis is a two win player, right? Like cause the fielding and the running isn't there and you can say, hey, 38 bombs. Yeah, he did, mm -hmm. but he has a low on base and yes. just valuing him like, right, like uh, Lucas Duda's like, you know, you look at his numbers and that sort of thing, it better if you look at Moustakis and say, yeah, and he's a two-win player. We're going to pay him on the basis of that. Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. That's what I mean. I'm not saying some perfect system, but that seems to be what's happening. And again, I'm just allowing for the Angels and other teams in the day-to-day -day real world where you're assessing, like even looking at, look, all right, let's talk the big picture. That's where he wanted uh, to go, too. Mustakis wanted to go there. Sure. Uh, so did Hosmer. Ho what do you make of Eric Hosmer? Is this guy, because I'm fascinated by it. Totally. Big winner, high baseball IQ. I get all of that. Yet, last year was his peak year. He, did, he was a four-win player. He just got paid. What do you think? I have so many thoughts on Eric Hosmer. Um, <laughs> I think the defense is overrated. Um, I mean, his defense is better than, than the metrics are saying. No, I think it's overrated. I, from, from, I think from a, a scouting standpoint, people look at him as better than what the metrics say, and I think that... Uh, it's because when you look at the two components, and this is really getting into the weeds because I've talked about this a lot with a lot of people, uh, what are the things he does well? And this is something actually that I'm partially stealing from Mike Petriello. I hope he's not in the room. Um, what does he do well? He throws and he picks. So it looks like, but what's the fundamental thing that makes elite defenders? It's range. It's the ability to get to a lot of stuff. But at first base too. Right. So it, it, absolutely, even, really? even there. Oh, yeah, no. to me. So throwing and picking, I, I, I would not be surprised if he still expanded his power. I don't love the ground ball rate for sure. He, he's a way overpay. I will also tell you this. As someone that's in clubhouses a lot, and don't make me try and quantify it because I can't, but Eric Hosmer is a guy that I, as someone who is a sabermetric guy, will talk intangibles. And here's what I will tell you and maybe this is an explosive topic and maybe it's not. But the baseball people in here, the white guys in Major League Baseball that are willing to learn Spanish and bring the Latin guys into the larger group have value. Greater, you, it's, it's a big deal. It's why someone like Alex Bregman I think has an intangible quality that when this is still a, a, a white conservative game, in my opinion, and when you get the white players that are willing to take the clubhouse and and everybody's together, there's some value to that. There are not. I couldn't give you very many players that I would say it about. Eric Hosmer is one of them. Okay, what's that worth? No idea. So, and and he's young enough that I would not be surprised if. As I said, the ground ball thing went to a slightly better direction, and he hit a little bit better. But overall, it's an overpay. How was that for a good rambling gas bag? That was answer? good. Thank you. But, Thank you. By the way, this is just for this room. It's embargoed. You can't go with that. Um, it's already been tweeted. Um, no, there's, there's no question. Look, I look at the guy, too, and we've had conversations on MLB Now about, like, I'm not ignoring um, the – the baseball IQ. I would have never paid him. You know, or ba baseball awareness. I would have paid him something. Well, right? I mean, at a certain point, you love everybody. But by right, a 385 on base, which slung 498, four win player, has value, but this intangibles, premium intangibles of Scott Boris. By the way, Scott Boris at that press conference, did you see that? It was the best. That was the best. He goes, I'm so pleased that modern analytics have been proven wrong. I mean, why even fight that fight? Because, like, on the same team, Lorenzo Cain just got paid, 
Lorenzo Cain, who's like slugged 440, not a big home run hitter, but fielder, right? Base runner, center fielder doing all that. Nice on base, nice batting average, well-rounded. That guy gets, you know, 80 million. Like, so I think that there's a give and take. Um, and hopefully, look, there's, the Players Association has to address something in all of this because certainly the free agent system, which worked in the 70s, um, doesn't work for them now because everybody's hip to where the age curve is. Yep. You know? So that, that doesn't work. I will tell you, look, I'm a nice guy. But there's nothing that aggravates me more than when people say stuff like that, analytics being proven wrong. It's like Mark and Vince, like tonight on the roof, you'll be hearing from the guy that thinks two plus two equals five. It'll be an hour-long conversation. You know what I mean? Like, what, what are we, it's done. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, you know what I think part of it is, and the reason I'll bring up on the show too, and you know, my producers and researchers will say to me like recently, like, I'm a little disturbed by the way you're talking because I will talk about makeup and I will talk about leadership but I think it's because of, it's, it's, it's a specific thing. We're, not, 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 not everybody, not all mainstream baseball fans, because a lot of mainstream baseball fans are really, like you speak to them on a, on a national audience, so you've got to be careful. They're still talking batting average and triple crown, yes. and there's nothing wrong with that. You have a brat, have a beer, enjoy the game, of course. But I think within the industry itself, and now in a good part of the media now, not just yes. you know, the, like the, the underground internet, because now that's taken over, a good part, we're speaking the same language. We'll do this one. You Let know? me ask you this. And, and I, you know, we, again, we get in the weeds about this stuff. But look at the four major sports, or if you, just, if you want to take hockey out and just do baseball, basketball, and football. Which sport is covered at the smartest level? It's not close. When you talk about dumb narrative stuff, it's everywhere. Baseball, in terms, like, still, the, this, the analytics seep, seep through and baseball is covered at a higher level. You are getting mm -hmm. a smarter level of coverage of this sport than those other two sports. You just are. Mm. You just are. Well, I think a lot of times it's, it, it is. I mean, when I talk about, like, old-time sports writers, it's not everybody, of course, because we grew up reading a lot of these sports writers who we revere. Um, but it's always easier to go to an easier narrative yes. than do the work. And I, again, just to get back to where, you know, where I am with, if we're speaking the same language, now, again, you and I wouldn't have some crazy conversation about Eric Hosmer at all. We're, we've already arrived at 385 on base, 498 slugging. If that's a 123 OPS, weighted runs created plus, it's in a tough, it's in a tough hitter's park. Take that, into a, take that into consideration. His exit velocity is actually quite good. I think it's top 20, but he hits a ton of ground balls. But did he do that because he was in Kauffman Stadium? Perhaps. Right. Um, he started hitting to all fields about two years ago, so he shows a propensity to learn. Right? So we're already there. And so now, now that we're all in agreement, now how is he moving forward? Well, a lot of that is makeup. A lot of that is his habits. I asked Mike Trout yesterday, why are you superstars getting married so young? Have you noticed that? Like, and I, don't, I don't have data on this. But I know Chris Bryant, Bryce Harper, Mike Trout, super rich, super famous, married right away. Now, and if I'm a general manager, I have to admit, I really like that. Why? You know, habits, stability. Now I'm talking this old sports writery nonsense, however, yes. but we've already arrived on what the pr raw production is. Am I losing you, John? I did not uh, John see Scott. this yes. turn coming. Yes. I did not. I mean, we talked about a lot of stuff over there in the corner. That's right. I did not see this So coming. when I shake your hand, look right in my eyes, firm handshake, and say, yes, sir, very good, sir. I'll say, I Marriage like, I like that modern kid. player. Yeah, that's right. But um, no, that's true. And you know what? I said that actually about Trout. I tweeted it out because I went and met um, Mike and his girlfriend at the time last year, we had an MLB Network Presents on Mike Trout, um, you know, the Millville Meteor to whatever, uh, to MVP. Um, and, you know, got to see him and really talked about his upbringing, had a good conversation with his girlfriend, and just saw how he operated. And I just liked the cut of his jib. Look, and we love the production already. We know the production. And then some, and I tweeted that out, and oh man, I got attacked by, now the new, the new right-wing intelligentsia going after me, going, oh, you're soft in the head, you're doing the same old sports writer nonsense. And someone said, hey, name one guy who's, you know, you know who hasn't made it because he wasn't married and he's blah, blah, blah. And I said, I used to box with Mike Tyson. No, so I know a guy who can go off the rails. You can have everything and go south fast. Like someone, give me an example. There's an example that I lived with. Like I saw it up close. So yeah, the fact is, like, and I don't know why they're getting married early, but they seek the stability. They have it. So you look at these things with makeup, whether it's 
um, Trout or whether it's looking at a guy like, do I lay out $120 million for Ioannis Cespedes? Like, I love the production. I might not like the habits, like playing golf on a playoff day and coming out early because your shoulder hurts. When it affects your production, right. it affects my thinking. All right, does that yeah, explain I, it? No, I get no. it. I mean, again, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot to digest there. I do, look, <laughs> I, Sorry. to me, the, the thing that, to, if, you know, bring it, bring it back to where, where you were talking before, the part that I find so interesting is how much of this stuff is now filtering down to the field. I was just telling you as we were coming up here, Justin Turner telling me a story, and he's obviously a guy that's gotten into the launch angle thing and has turned into a magnificent hitter, but he told me a story late last year they were playing, the Dodgers are playing the Giants, and Posey's playing first, and Turner singled. And when he got to first, Posey comes over to, to the bag and says to him, what's your fly ball rate right now? Is it over 60%? These hmm. are the conversations these guys are having now. I mean, they're aware. And the thing yep. we were as well talking about, look, I don't love – where the game is right now in terms of lack of balls in play. I mean, I, I, I went to, to prep a game. This is true, a Yankee-Red Sox game on a Friday night at Yankee Stadium. And in the first 53 minutes of just running time from the first pitch, five balls were put in play. Wow. That's a torture yeah. session, and I love yeah. this sport. That's a torture session, okay? Who wants that? Now, that said, the thing I mentioned to you how we got here is fascinating. The adjustment to the adjustment to the adjustment, the data that's being used to evaluate players that players are, are using, whether it's shifting, and now I don't want to hit the ball on the ground because I'm out to launch angle. To, I mean, it, 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 the adjustments are happening so quickly. Right. Oh, the Cubs-Indians alone in the World Series became like a fastball-free affair. Right. Very quickly. Right. So it's happening game yeah. to game. Absolutely. Game to game. Uh, a lot of these players, it's funny, we asked when we were doing 30 clubs in 30 days, we asked everybody, what's your favorite sabermetric stat? And of course, a bunch of them said, I don't have one, nothing. And then off camera, I'd ask them, I'm like, come on, man. Like, like what? Like, what are you working on? Well, I'm working on my spin rate and changing my axis. And I'm, I'm like, well, what, do you, what do you think we're talking about? Come on. You know, like, like so, no, like, it, it has gone. So the sabermetrics I've seen in the revolution, to wrap this up, and then we'll take cards if you have some cards for some questions. Um, to go from like a larger economic um, standing to where it is affecting labor and management. Look, again, uh, for those of you who are old enough, if you're young enough, you don't remember this. A player was supposed to peak in his early 30s. Bill James said 30 something years ago, and perhaps others said it too, but it was predominantly Bill James said, actually players peak 26 to 28, maybe 25 to 29. It was an outrageous thought at the time. Well, now it's happened, and the Players Association is going to have to adjust. So that's happened, but also what we're talking about on the field, man, yeah. it's a war of information. And, these, and especially guys who are coming up playing year-round now, uh, these, guys are, these guys are locked in. And why wouldn't you study yourself and your, your behavior and your habits? And uh, Elvis Andrus said something interesting, and then you can look over those cards and see it's some, something good. Um, and I didn't expect this. I was talking to Elvis Andrus at, at Rangers camp. And I said, hey, man, you had a really good defensive year. And it kind of dipped a little bit, and you came back up. And he said, you know what? He goes, the Bulls always hit to me. I said, come on. Like, that sounds like some vague nonsense that one of us would say or something. Like, ball seems to be always hit to him. He's saying, the ball is always hit to me. He goes, no, we have such pinpoint scouting. We have such, we have, we have such information that I found. He goes, when I broke in, my range was much more important. Now it's a matter of making the play of the ball is being hit to me. Like, that's a, that's a guy who's played, what, seven, eight years now in the major leagues. Uh, and is a plus defender saying that. So, like the the sabermetric change of the game to me is is fascinating. And there's people in this room that you know deserve this credit. So, thank you, yeah. gentlemen. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. For all sure. Right. We got some all good? right. You ready? All right. Here we go. This is. Am I saying? Yeah. All right. We'll just read it. My point. Okay. So this is right to me. <laughs> Hosmer in language. Uh, inclusivity is an interesting one. You said that intangible holds value to who primarily? Is it in dollars? terms reflected in salary, player development, staff, manager, minor league, OPS. So to me, I would say, again, it's the subtlety of the comfort in the clubhouse that you think is going to translate on the field. And again, I understand the path that I'm, I'm going down, but to think that if you think that a guy getting 
divorced isn't going to affect his play. This is in the same type of family. There are plenty of guys that come over that isolate themselves. A lot of times, you know, there is the language barrier that, that is a struggle. Um, so it's, it's nuanced. If, if you, you know, want me to produce it or hold my feet to the fire, BK, I can't. I can't deliver on it. No, no, of course. It's, it's absolutely true. We know this in the real world. Mark DeRosa told me a story. I think he went playing, and I forgot what country he went to play in, but went to play winter ball when he was a younger player. And he said he got stranded at the airport, like, you know, someone didn't come to pick him up that was supposed to. And he's sitting there with his bags in a foreign country, doesn't know the language, and he's just stranded. And he said he had to make his way to try to make the way to the hotel, ask people, find out, do they use cabs? How do, we, how do I get there? Then what do I do? What do I do for food? And I said, now you know what the guy from that country feels like when he comes here. Yeah. And I was like, wow. And so, yes, Joe Madden tells stories of when he was in the minor leagues. He used to round up the guys on off days, the guys who came from other countries, and said, let's go shopping. Because they didn't know they needed sweaters. They didn't know what to buy. They just had no clue. So, of course, and you know, to make you happier and more fulfilled so you can focus on your high-level job, of, of, of course that helps. Absolutely. What is the value in collecting data on a player's mental approach to the game? I'll let you take that. Oof. That's it. I mean, that's I don't know. Well, yeah, that's that's a whole new area, and probably, there's probably people in this room that can address that more directly. But, right, uh, decision making, neurological science, that's a whole avenue. Right. If I'm with a major league club, I'm definitely studying that. I know I've read the Red Sox were doing that. I mean, you'll look at everything now. Um, it is difficult to measure the ability, you know, your ability to cope. But I'm not saying you can't measure it, uh, go back to an answer I had for you before, I certainly try, Yes. right? And I think clubs are trying that. You're trying everything. They're, you know, these, you're making decisions, tens of millions of dollars. And then even once you get the guy, if you can get him to adjust better to life, if you can make his life better, you might get more of your money back. I, you know, it's a time to stop for a second. I, I, I don't know how many years I've, I've come here, but I always I try and make the point. I, I think a lot of times people outside this room will just say, um, they think that what we're talking about is stats. And it's not FIP and war. It's not just that. Remember, it's got a definition. Remember what Bill said, the search for objective knowledge mm -hmm. about baseball. Like, yeah, that's and, what you're looking for. And frequently the evidence are statistics, but, At, it's no, not, but not always. But, 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 but always. I think that right. we, we, it has a tendency to be covered in a way that everything is framed just about you know, using some, some stat and it's, it's not quite that. Good information is good information. Can you address how StatCast visualization has helped engage the public and moved analytics forward? No. <laughs> you, know, you know, kidding. <laughs> you know, it is. Um, I wonder how much fans love it. Um, you know, I think we're getting to a place now where, like, the, the, like the cool thing that has gotten in now is your expected WOBA. Like your, you know, what, what your weighted on base is expected to be given uh, the exit velocity, the launch, and the distance, and all that. Like I think that, like you know, again, I know Tom Tango in the group and Mike Petriello working hard to get to 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 mix the stew, right? You have all these measurements now. Well, what do you do with them? And teams are working hard to get it now. How much does a fan love that? I don't, I don't know. And I'm sure it's forced down your throat, it's forced down my throat. It's a weird stat that is suddenly coming from corporate yep. and coming on down. But look. I look at it, that's good, rather than have to fight its way up. It's like it's got the importer of Major League Baseball, so like, hey, why don't we use this stuff as often as possible? And I'm always saying, well, yes, of course. Context is important. You know, right. where, where we, you know, you asked me something about broadcasting, disseminating information. For me, and I, I mean, look, it's the same as far as your show, just eliminating the noise. And, and it's, do you ever see, it's, it's like the, all right, this is a weird one, but the, you ever heard the David Foster Wallace commencement address, This is Water? It's really interesting. He talks about teaching people how to think. And so you're, you're ultimately just trying to, I don't want to put a graphic up that says Clayton Kershaw has the most wins over the last 10 years, because that, to some extent, there is an implicit teaching people how to think, that anybody on that list is good. Kershaw is good, but that is not how we want to arrive at that. Does that make sense? Yep. So that's, I mean, I think that stuff's important to acknowledge for what you're doing and for what I'm doing. No. Yeah, I, I, um, the StatCast stuff is, is fascinating. I mean, even uh, talked to Charlie Blackman about it. 
and it's evidence, right? You want more evidence, and the defensive metrics are not good for Charlie Blackman, and it really kind of hurts him in MVP cases. Um, I don't know if it'll hurt him financially, but the guy had a fantastic season, obviously, last year, and he looks like he's decent out there. And I think there's only been one guy in the history of Coors Field center field that has had positive defensive runs saved, and I think it was Willie Tavares, and he was plus two in the year before he was with the Astros, and he was like way up, like, I don't know, plus 10, 12, something like that. So it, it seems like something is happening that's not quite fair. Seems, I don't know if it's true, as the stack cast measurements come out, I think they're still not really in Charlie's favor, right? So at least that's more evidence to say, that's not bunk, maybe there's something we, we're missing here, and he looks the part, but it's not quite there. Because now the stack cast stuff is measuring you know, his speed to the ball and the catch probability. How, how, do, you di- how do you digest it? Because I still look at it kind of as a guide. I still, I feel confident being able to break down who the best hitters are. Just you leave me in a mm-hmm. room and I, like I'm good. Defensively, I'm not just going to take, I, I'm still not at that place where I'm going right. to take, take those numbers. Not um, at full face value, yeah. right? But eventually the evidence piles up. That's what I'm saying with Charlie yes. Blackman or with Andrew McCutcheon a few years ago. The evidence starts to pile, pile up where no, I'm believing it. And I know, apologies to John Dewan, right? I'm, you know, look, I just don't take it completely, but it's my first thing I'm looking at saying, all right, there it is. Now let's discuss it. And you can discuss it. Can I, all right, when, after I say this, you guys have to all gasp, okay? <laughs> but I'm going to give you one. This is true, though. I really do believe this. Mike Trout's rookie year, fraud. <gasps> nice, well done. What do you mean? <laughs> Not really. But the defense and the base running, at a level in terms of how it how, how that they got to that war is a, at a level that he has not sniffed both so of wait, what good, are you saying? I'm saying that I think that those defensive numbers are wrong when his numbers were decent defensive metrics were good I'm saying his rookie year his rookie year war is as good a rookie year war as we've ever seen mm-hmm. and it's based on base running and it's that incredible because the base running in the defense is that good. And I don't buy that they were that good. Because we've never seen him do any, I don't believe it. What How's do that? Mean? I don't, I don't miss it. Because his defensive metrics now have gone south. We were talking about Correct. that with him. And you're thinking they weren't good his first year? I think, I, I think they also tried to give him credit for, and maybe they were acquiescing to something else, but actual, like, uh, they, they were giving him a defensive run saved for actually saving a run over the fence. Technically, it is one run that he actually physically took back. Yes. So they gave him credit for that. And maybe he had two or three that year. Yeah. Maybe that piled and made it look skewed. But fraud, come I on. Mean, I, come on. Well, let me come stir on. it up a little bit. <laughs> All right, we got another question. No, we got to go. All right. We got to go? Yo, you'll do one more? Right, one All right, more. one more. Call it tanking, call it losing to win, call it a rebuild. The immediate product on the field is the same. You present a team of 10 to 15 replacement level players at any given time. A few low priced veterans on short term deals that serve as trade chips July 1st and August 31st, and maybe five to 10, is there a question here? Uh, In other words, a team guaranteed to lose a minimum of 85 games with a high likelihood of losing 20 to 25 more. Okay, Um, I'm pro tanking. Like, you know, I'm I'm sorry, you're not supposed to say tanking. I'm pro tanking. If you're, you're, you're saying you're trying to win, but you cannot keep your foot on the accelerator every single year. Agreed. It does not work. You'll burn out your engine. So you need to rebuild. And we've learned, like, being in the middle is being nowhere. Can you, can you, what about this, though? And I'm with you. Can you take that idea, put it off to the side, and say it's not good for the game when 10 of the teams are basically in that mode? Maybe, because the other result is look at your playoffs last year. Super teams collide, right? I mean, that's the, not changing, by the way. Uh, okay. Well, no, I, I think things will evolve, but I, so, right, it, it's not great for the game during the season that there's a bunch of teams that are going all out, but come playoff time, every series was monstrous, Agreed. right? Every series was super teams gearing up, and there's something to, we used to talk about this in the NFL years ago, like the era of the super teams actually helps the league. I don't know if that's true, but I, I felt like the playoffs last year were fantastic, and that at least is a, uh, a positive byproduct of all the teams doing the drastic rebuild. Uh, I think we're, they're giving us the hook. Uh, I enjoyed this so much. Thank You're you, awesome. Boo. You're Thank great. You. Fellas, Thank enjoy you. it, everybody. Okay.